So as a physicist, when we try to understand a system, there are two popular ways. One way is a top to bottom approach, where we take a system, we tear it apart into smaller and smaller pieces. We study the properties of those smaller pieces and then predict or make hypothesis about the larger system. Another popular approach, which is slightly non-conventional, is uh, uh, it's like a bottom-up approach, where instead of uh, looking at the smaller systems, we look at systems as a whole. We look at them as a collective. We uh, understand the systems from the perspective of collectives or organization. So this, uh, this kind of understanding helps us understand uh, uh, a phenomena called emergence. Uh, emergence is basically, uh, in an uh, anthropological sense, uh, it means that the system as a whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So we'll, uh, we'll try to do a very simple exercise to understand uh, a phenomena of uh, emergence, which is synchronization. Uh, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ask you guys to do a simple thing. So uh, when I ask you guys to start clap, you'll start clapping. And then when, la, when I'll ask you guys to start clapping, you'll start clapping. And we'll just collectively clap and we'll see what will happen. So one, two, three, start. Keep clapping, start. Louder, louder. Stop. So did you observe what happened over here? So initially, you started with different frequency of uh, clapping. So because of your neuromuscular response or something. Uh, and uh, so, so basically we started with different uh, frequency of clapping, but eventually we reached to a common frequency. So this is a simple example of synchronization that you guys uh, eventually did over here. Uh, in case of synchronization or any emergent phenomena, the currency is interaction. In our case, the interaction was visual cues and audio cues. So if I'll ask you a question that what will happen if I confine you, I, we'll do the same exercise, what will happen if I confine you guys in a glass box, transparent glass box? Would you be able to synchronize again? Uh, I guess you would be able to, uh, but it will take a larger amount of time because now you, you are in a soundproof box, you can't hear it, you can only see the visual cues. What will happen if I uh, put you guys in a glass box which is soundproof and it is also opaque? Now you won't be able to sort of synchronize. This phenomenon of synchronization, it occurs in scales and systems across biology, physics, economics, and whatever. So uh, I'll give you a small uh, biological example of this synchronization. So fireflies, they sort of flickers around, okay? But when they uh, uh, arrive to a tree or some, somewhere collectively, this is what they do. This is not uh, the Diwali lights. These are the real uh, fireflies. They synchronize in a way uh, that all of them flickers at the same frequency. It is something like uh, two people are running around the running around the ground, a circular ground, and one guy is faster, other one is slower. You ask the faster guy to uh, slow, uh, slow, slow down, and you ask the, uh, the slower guy to fasten up a little bit so that all of them rotate in the same frequency. So this is exactly what you guys did while, uh, uh, while we did this clapping experiment. Uh, this phenomenon of synchronization is not just temporal, it happens on spatio-temporal uh, cases also, for example, in case of uh, school of fishes. So fishes, uh, they show this behavior of schooling and swarming when they move around in a school, and they follow a very simple rule, uh, at least mathematically. What they do is, uh, there's one fish, uh, it reorientates its direction according to the nearest neighbor that it sees. So either it averages out its uh, uh, velocity according to its nearest neighbor, or it just follows uh, a one uh, particular uh, neighbor, which is like most influential neighbor or something. And they, uh, they uh, like uh, show these very beautiful properties, which are not just aesthetical, uh, but they uh, help them to uh, sway away from the predators. Uh, birds, they form flocks, they form these beautiful patterns of flocking, and uh, yeah, so uh, as I told you, interaction is the currency of any emergent behavior. And recently we showed that if we change interaction, so initially uh, these guys might jam, but if I change the interaction, we uh, include a term called memory in that. And uh, these guys are able to form spontaneous lanes. They are able to unjam. So what will happen if I apply this to a, a traffic problem, a spatio-temporal synchronization in traffic? This is what it would look like here. The interaction is happening in such a way that all of these guys are sort of synchronized. You see? There's no collision, there's no accident. Uh, 
So really important question is, is discipline really required? Are universal discipline really required? Like these traffic rules are really required? So the question is no. We need more efficient interaction. I uh, will uh, we'll quick on, uh, quickly go on with a few more examples, uh, like lasers. What's the difference be between laser and this ordinary light? This ordinary light uh, emits frequencies of all the frequencies, but in case of lasers, atoms synchronizes and they emit a uh, light of same frequency. So they are more sharper and they are much better. Uh, synchronization, uh, so I'll uh, tell you a quick uh, story uh, regarding uh, synchronization. So, uh, so there's some problem with my cell phone that whenever I pick it up, uh, my camera and flash switches on. So I was having an evening walk in the ISC campus. I picked up my phone, the camera and flash switched on. And I saw uh, some pattern in, uh, on my cell phone. I thought that it might be due to sweat. So I went back, went back home. I washed my hand, dried my hand. Uh, I repeated the same thing and I recorded the video. And I want, to, I want you guys to see if you can see the pattern over here. There's some flickering that you can observe. So when I, uh, when I applied a simple uh, image processing operation over this video, uh, this is what I got. This is nothing but your heartbeat. This is not 95% accurate or 90, this is 10% your heartbeat. Because when your heart pumps blood, there is a local pressure variation over this area, which like changes the way uh, the uh, intensity of reflected light, light looks like. So this is exactly how your pulse oximeter works. Uh, heart itself relies on a phenomena of synchronization. There are millions of uh, pacemaker cells which are present uh, inside the heart, which synchronizes in such a way that leads to a rhythmic pattern in heart. Uh, uh, synchronization happens in all the scale. So even sperms, when they uh, follow, uh, follow across the fallopian tubule and uh, they uh, fertilize an egg, uh, due to collective phenomena, they might increase or decrease the fertility of, uh, of the system. But too much synchronization is also not good. There's a uh, phenomena called epilepsy, which is like a neuro, neurological disorder, in which what happens is the neurons present in your brains, they hypersynchronize in a disruptive manner, and this leads to concussion and uh, loss of consciousness. So that's about active metaphysics. I'll quickly uh, take you through my adventures of technology and, well, innovations. So when I was in my uh, freshman year in college, um, uh, I had a friend who was a PWD. He, his, one of his arm was amputated, and other arm, arm has some muscular dystrophy, so due to which he was not able to operate the computer that effectively. So I made a, a small machine learning based uh, personal project for him so that he can operate the computer using his facial expressions. And this is how it works. For example, if you want to control the computer, he can use his facial movement. If you want to do the right click, left click, he can just do, do the right blink and left blink of his eye. And if you want to, let's say, type something, uh, he can use uh, our uh, Pi Audio uh, voice typing. So using this interface, he was able to create this complex uh, mechanical design. This is what he sort of created, just using his facial expression. This is a complex design in AutoCAD. It is not uh, like easy to do. So imagine how the lives of millions of people might change, and it, to some extent, uh, did change. Uh, so we developed a, a desktop app for this. We also received an award by Google and Enable India as the best tech, tech solution. Uh, but awards are vanity matrix. Um, uh, a few years back when I was there in uh, Bangalore, I met this guy called Suresh K. He was an uh, associate manager to, at, in some IT firm. And uh, due to an accident, uh, his spinal cord got injured and his almo almost 60 to 70 percent of his body was disabled. When I gave this interface to him, initially it was hard for him to uh, control it in order to get acquainted with it. But uh, three weeks after, I got a call from his bro brother and I went to his house. I saw how he, how he was able to make entries in the Excel sheet using this interface, how he was, scro how he was able to scroll around, how he was able to type code in uh, his Python IDE. And it was like wonderful. So he told me that uh, you don't understand how, what it means to me. I was not able to do, th do this for last three years. So he called me close to him and he gave me a hug. And I don't think I would ever receive that degree of contentment from anything. <laughs> I'll, I'll quickly tell you about an another sort of innovation that uh, I developed and it's an interesting story again. So uh, when we were in uh, sophomore year in college, uh, some of our friends, we pitched up and we, uh, uh, picked up some money and we bought a VR headset and handles for playing interactive games. But uh, one fine night when we were doing higher studies, uh, 
mango sativa to be more uh, specific, uh, someone broke that VR headset and uh, it was not functional anymore. And it was really expensive to get it repaired, let alone buy another set. So we brainstormed for a few weeks and we developed uh, an uh, AI based interface which can take your body posture and convert that into uh, gaming commands. So this is what it does. For example, in, in the corner you can see the user is uh, standing in front of the camera and walking around. The commands are converted into the game. For example, if you want to run, he can do that. You run and you run in the computer. You need, you don't need any external uh, devices or uh, a gyroscope or any uh, extension. You just need a camera, uh, a low-end two megapixel uh, camera which is available in your uh, laptop. It can do like jumps, and you can even do things like this. Pretty good, right? So we developed it and uh, well, it worked really fine. So there, there are two things that we did which accidentally made it super efficient. One thing was we uh, used a well curated training data set and uh, another thing we did was we trained it in such a way that even a, a very small motion, for example, this is a 90 degree motion. Even if uh, the user makes a nine degree motion, it was able to detect it, uh, detect it completely. So which makes it, which may, may, made it super uh, efficient. So someone from Meta, Facebook reached out to us inquiring about what we have developed. Uh, around this and uh, la this year uh, Meta, Facebook selected our, uh, us for their XR program bootcamp with they, which, is, which they run with the Ministry of Electronics and uh, uh, Information Technology. So it was a cool project which started with uh, you know a small college uh, rush I guess. Uh, in 2021 when I uh, uh, finished my internship at Harvard when I came back to India there was uh, an oxygen crisis in India. And during that time, we developed this device called OxyServe. So OxyServe was basically an oxygen conservation, optimization, and monitoring device. And how it works is like uh, respiration is not a linear process, right? But when uh, patients are given oxygen, they are, they are supplied with a continuous flow of oxygen. The problem with continuous flow of oxygen is that it wastes around 60% of medical oxygen, which is uh, like available to hospitals. Apart from that, the uh, giving continuous flow of oxygen uh, has one disadvantage that it leads to uh, complexities like hypoxemia, hyperoxemia, uh, oversaturation, stuff like that. So we developed this device. We collaborated with around 40 to 50 doctors. We did some testing. We applied for a patent. And uh, the question is not why we came up with this. Well, why is obvious. We came up with this because there was a factor of empathy involved and a certain scientific challenge we wanted to solve. Uh, but how is yeah, even interesting story. So a uh, few years back, I was working at uh, ISRO. Uh, when I came back, I was working on a project related to human space flight research. So on the corner, you can see uh, the top corner is uh, astronaut Rakesh Sharma. Yeah, we were ha having a discussion with a lot of people. Uh, is astronaut Rakesh Sharma, first Indian astronaut. And the bottom is uh, astronaut Fred Gregory, who was an Apollo astronaut. And we were working on a device uh, which optimizes the flow of oxygen when astronauts go for a spacewalk. So basically, it's really expensive to uh, you know send payloads to uh, International Space Station or space in general. So we, we were working on this device. So when COVID came, we used this space tech for health tech. So yeah. Uh, so to conclude my talk, uh, uh, we started with the question of emergence. And I think that innovation is just like the, it's like emergence of new ideas which are driven by empathy and curiosity. Uh, so from smallest subatomic particles to large social network, the study of emergence help us understand that system as a whole is greater than some of its parts. And we all are effectively greater than uh, the sum of our parts. Empathy is generally considered as a uh, cohesive force for a society. But I personally think that empathy can be used as a tool of innovation. When we use empathy as a tool of innovation, uh, the thing which happens is uh, the problem statement that we try to solve the innovation might, might not be as you know as fancy or as uh, technology ad, uh, technologically advanced as uh, as it should be but it solves the exact problem it exactly hits the pain point and that's uh, my uh, understanding about empathy so as a society it it helps us to understand the emergence help us to understand the power of collaboration and collective empathy thank you so much that was my talk. <laughs>